Hello and good evening. Uh, good morning to some of you. I am Paul Vixie. I am one of the uh, three founders of a nonprofit project that is headquartered in Europe, and I'm here to talk to you about that today. It is a security information exchange, and to be a security information exchange um, could mean a lot of things, but for us, it means real-time um, observations. So uh, we, we don't deal in reputational or threat related. Uh, we're, we're all about trying to find out sort of what is true from one moment to the next about, in this case, the European internet. Um, so let me launch right in here. You will never protect anything that you cannot observe. Uh, that's a variation on a theme of you cannot uh, manage what you cannot measure. Um, and so, uh, although what you're protecting might change and how you go about that, um, and your, for that matter, your motives for protecting it can all change. But ultimately, you have to have a good source of information about how a network is behaving uh, in order to protect that network. And uh, sometimes protecting a network takes a, a long form, for example, investigation after an attack. That's not uh, defense in the normal sense, but it is a, a way to seek uh, accountability, to, to seek recourse. And so even that in, in our terminology is a form of defense. Um, so DNS at present is the domain name system is responsible for uh, almost all other activities because before you can, let's say, connect to a email server or a web server, in other words, every click of the mouse inside of a web browser, uh, which is therefore causing that browser to connect to a web server, all of that, every one of those clicks, everything you do uh, starts with DNS transaction. Um, largely so that maybe a browser can discover the address that a given web property would like them to use. Uh, but you might also be discovering uh, wh where to send email for a certain domain. Uh, and there are a lot of other variations like that, but that gives the flavor. Um, and of course, one of the things we do when we're trying to characterize the behavior of a network is NetFlow. And NetFlow is a packet sampling technique that is present in most commercial routers. And it allows you to uh, build a telemetry stream coming out of your router going into your analysis engine so that you can get some sense of uh, sort of how your network is being used. Uh, that visibility is uh, a key to most corporate defense and all military defense. But um, just uh, what that tells you is what happened. It does not tell you why it happened. And so you, you really have to observe your network in more than one way, get several perspectives, and then cross-correlate those perspectives. And for me, coming as I do from a DNS background, uh, I used to be responsible for the bind software, for example. Um, it seems obvious that uh, gathering transactions from DNS and um, you know, uh, coordinating those with your observations of other behavior uh, is a way to get a complete picture of a network so that you can either manage it or, or defend it. So uh, I'll see if I can uh, drill down into some of the motives here. Um, if you're looking for an anomalies, in other words, uh, behavior that is unusual, you must by definition know what is the normal behavior. You have to characterize your network in times that it's not being attacked and I know that's rare, uh, but you have to have a sort of a general background observation uh, of how your network is behaving so that when an anomaly occurs, such as you're about to be attacked uh, or you are being attacked, uh, you can say, hey, that's, that's not normal. That is an anomaly. Uh, so when I say I'm interested in observation, I don't mean I'm, I want to turn it on during the times you know you're being attacked. This is a constant background monitoring activity that we must all invest in, just as we invest in syslog or uh, maybe a logarithm or Splunk, or there's a lot of things that you have to invest in now 
because every network has to defend itself. This is, this is not like the old pre-internet world where you could count on the police to keep your business safe or maybe count on your military to keep your, your business safe. Uh, on the internet, it's uh, pretty much every network has to defend itself. And to do that, you need uh, an extensive investment in uh, monitoring, constant background monitoring. And what this will do, at least in the DNS case, is to make relationships discoverable. And when I say relationship, I'm really, uh, let's harken back to the defense use case. If you imagine that uh, there's a business email compromise attack, someone has forged email to your chief financial officer. Um, and that email is forged as though to come from your chief executive officer. And so you've got uh, email that is forged that uh, nevertheless looks legitimate, as, as legitimate as it can, and it's asking to make a wire transfer. Um, and you know, it's a mystery to me why email would be enough to trigger a wire transfer, but there are businesses who have lost money to this attack. And um, one of the things you might want to do is to find out who did it. And of course, the, the ultimate, uh, the, the, the criminal does not want to be discovered. They want to, they want to behave without accountability. They want you to have no recourse. And so they will use a throwaway domain name. Uh, they might use an IP address that belongs to some botnet somewhere. In other words, they'll use internet identifiers that cannot be traced to them. So sometimes the task of an investigator is to then uh, try to see what relationships those throwaway identifiers have uh, to other identifiers. Because if you can promote a single indicator of, of compromise into an asset cloud, you can sometimes build a forensic finger, fingerprint. Uh, this does not lead you to the, uh, the home address of your attacker, but it does allow you to determine sometimes that you have seen this attacker before. And if you see them in the future, you'll know that you've seen them before. And that uh, is far better than nothing. And sometimes uh, nothing is what we have. The internet is a perfect vehicle for uh, unaccountable behavior. Um, so in the case of live data, you might want to see the lookup, uh, the DNS lookup that occurs in real time. Uh, one example of that is a botnet. If, let's say, um, you get a query through your name servers from some laptop inside your company network, and it's asking for a domain name that no one's ever asked for before now, and it is a domain name that is part of a botnet, it's part of a, a domain generation algorithm, which is where the command and control address is, uh, it's actually a domain name that is uh, built programmatically based on the current date, sometimes the current date and time. And so if you see a lookup for the botnet command and control uh, name, today's uh, name for that botnet's command and control, that is a strong indicator that you are infected, that that laptop has just become infect infected with malware. And if you can then find out what they were doing just a few seconds earlier, you might find out sort of what website they visited that caused the drive-by download to infect them. Uh, but all of this relies on being able to monitor your traffic. Now there's also a use case involving stored data, and I mentioned this earlier, uh, which is by the time you are investigating an attack, um, it's really unlikely that the domain name that was used in that attack still exists. They attacked you, they probably attacked others. Eventually somebody complained, it was taken down at the registrar or the registry. Um, and so it's not in the DNS. So you might be uh, holding an empty bag. You're, you're wondering, okay, I see what domain name was used in this attack, but it no longer resolves. I wish I knew what it resolved to on the day of the attack. Well, that's where stored data related to DNS would come in. Um, and so that was uh, the concept here is uh, it's called passive DNS. It was invented by Florian Weimar uh, in 2005, 2006 or so. Uh, he presented famously at the first 
conference that year. Um, and passive DNS has become a big part of digital security uh, and for that matter, just uh, network management ever since. Um, and so again, having the history can help you find out what was true uh, during the attack period, which might be different than what you could find by making a, a live lookup today. The other problem with making a live lookup about a, uh, a domain name that was used in an attack is that the name servers for that domain name are operated by your attacker and um, they may be monitored. In other words, when you do a lookup on a, a name that was used to attack you, you are sometimes signaling to the attacker, by the way, the investigation has begun. And that might be something you don't want to signal. So using a, a purely passive technique where there are never queries initiated by an investigator about a domain name uh, is a more potent, potent approach. So uh, as with all uh, sort of good ideas, there are challenges in implementation. If there were no challenges, then probably the idea would have, uh, would have come by earlier. So I can tell you as one of the maintainers of BIND back in the 1990s and, and the 2000s, that um, asking a name server to record its traffic is a uh, losing game. Uh, the reason is, of course, the name server knows what names are being looked up. It knows what answers are being given. So it might seem easy to just instrument the name server to maybe write that information out to a file or send it to syslog or to do something with it other than briefly handle that information so that you answer the query and then uh, lose it all. Uh, but if you do that, you're going to lose data uh, because the network is traditionally much faster than the file system. And I know we all have SSDs and uh, we have you know, very vastly powerful computers, but it almost always turns out that the file system is slower than the network, especially this will be true during a DDoS attack where the network speed can be ramped up by your attacker to a threshold that you can no longer keep track of it. So you have to build your monitoring with the idea of constructive loss. So, um, in the original passive DNS implementation by Florian Weimar, uh, he used uh, PCAP, uh, the, the Berkeley packet filter. So this is the same thing that is used by um, TCP dump, for example. Uh, but in this case, we're not looking at all traffic and dumping it into uh, onto your screen. We're looking specifically for DNS traffic and we're dumping that into some kind of a batch file or database. We're doing something to store the data. And this has a great advantage, which is that PCAP is, uh, it's asynchronous. So if the name server is going faster than the monitoring, then the name server gets to run at full speed and the monitoring will lose data. And maybe that's a concern, uh, but you will not be dropping queries. You won't be slowing down. You won't cause retries. You will, you will in other words, not affect the, uh, the underlying service that you're trying to monitor. And I think that has to be our prime directive here. So I was responsible for an early attempt at generalizing this. Uh, we called it NCAP and it was okay. Uh, we learned in this case, how to reassemble UDP datagrams as nece when necessary. And it was necessary, it still is broadly necessary because the MTU for a network is, um, 1500 and the uh, size of a DNS response is often much bigger than that. So you'll get this as IP fragments and most monitoring systems don't even attempt to reassemble that, but we did that and we got that done and we were proud of that. So we generalized it to something called end message, which is what we use today, uh, which has a lot of powers beyond just passive DNS. Uh, all of this was open source software, by the way. So feel free to look for it on GitHub. I'll give you a URL at the end. So a common concern that is stated by uh, various companies, universities, ISPs, MSSPs about DNS monitoring is uh, what about GDPR? Uh, what about personally identifiable information? What about European data subjects? And um, we've always been concerned about this. And so in, in our work on this, which starts in 2006 and, uh, on my part, 
Uh, we have always said that people should have a reasonable expectation of privacy when using the DNS. And so while we want to know how the DNS is being used, we don't want to know who is using it because the, the source of a lookup is never important to an investigation. It might be important if you're trying to launch a new investigation, but that's not my goal. Uh, we're not in the surveillance business and I don't think you should be either. So if you look at this picture, you'll see that the stub resolvers like your laptop or smartphone or a VPS somewhere, um, that's where questions enter the system and that's where the personally identifiable information is. But it speaks to a recursive server, which I hope you all are operating on your own behalf, you not know, just sort of outsourcing it to Google and letting them do surveillance because uh, they can recover quite a bit of information if you do that. Um, but in all cases, when a recursive server has to act on your behalf, it has to go fetch data because what you are requesting is not in the DNS cache. That does not include the end user IP address. Um, it's just server to server traffic, uh, does not identify its source. And um, that's where we do our collection as you see here. So we have a security information exchange which witnesses the transactions between the recursives and the authorities. Um, and we do quite a bit with that. Uh, so there are some real-time applications and I'll demonstrate one of those in a moment. Uh, and there's also the database, which I've described and which I'll also demonstrate in a moment. But I just, I, I wanna urge everyone within the sound of my voice, please concern yourself with European data subjects. Please do not collect information which could be used to de-anonymize traffic. Um, because what I said about DNS, I think should be true of the internet in general. Uh, the expectation of privacy should be reasonable. And uh, right now it's not. So I urge all of you to um, act on the side of solving that problem instead of uh, what we sometimes do just as a business expedient, which makes it worse. So um, we have, I mentioned the problem of reassembling UDP. There's also a problem of reassembling TCP. There's a lot of DNS transactions do flow over TCP. And that is much harder to reassemble uh, as a sort of bump in the wire or so a, a, a packet monitor. And that will get even worse because we're beginning to encrypt those. Uh, DOH, DNS over HTTP, uh, is used increasingly between the stub resolver and the recursive. Uh, DNS over TLS, which is a different protocol, uh, is increasingly being used between the recursive and the authority. So in other words, using PCAP, using VPF, looking at packets is a declining benefit here. It's a, it's a, it is becoming a losing game. You have to be able to monitor the transactions from inside the name server itself. Uh, but as we learned with bind, we can't do that by connecting the name server to the file system, or we will affect the, uh, the, the correctness and the latency of the responses to questions that people ask us, which we don't wanna do. Uh, again, the prime directive is don't affect the service that you are monitoring. Um, and this is a graphical demonstration. This comes famously from Van Jacobson, uh, who has done an awful lot of work with TCP. Uh, so all you, what you can see here is that you, you have a very fast network at the endpoints, but you may have a bottleneck in between the endpoints, for example, the file system that will cause a lot of loss to occur. If that's going to occur, because you're, you're trying to collect data faster than you can store it, uh, you have to make sure that you are losing constructively. Don't just lose at random. Don't just lose whatever comes latest. Find a way to protect what you care most about. And in our case, what we care most about is the newest traffic. So if we're in a bottleneck situation uh, for DNS monitoring, we really want to discard the oldest information first. And that means that we have to not use the file system, but it also means we have to have a small queue of our own so that we've got things that we would like to share with the monitoring service. Uh, but if we find that we cannot because the monitoring service is, is too slow, then we want to discard the oldest information in our queue. Because of course, once you commit data to the network, it's very difficult to take it back out. Um, so that again is something we learned uh, 10 years ago and it has influenced our work. 
So we created some open source software. It's called DNS Tap and Framestream. Uh, it's all open source, and I'll give you the URL at the end. Um, and you know, we did this as a commercial company, but we did it knowing that we could only succeed if it became universal. And so we put it into uh, open source. I think it has an Apache license, so it's uh, it's maximally lenient. And there is it is a project that contains other companies as well now, not just Farsight Security. And it's in Bind, it's in Unbound, it's in Power DNS, it's in the Knot uh, resolver that comes from CZNIC. Um, and I, be I believe that some commercial providers are now looking at this also because it has become the universal method of monitoring the behavior of a name server, uh, which turns out to be quite useful. So our most modern sensor software uses that, although we have some sensor partners, uh, data participants, who use the older uh, packet-based solution because they have to. Uh, for some reason, maybe they can't upgrade their name server or they can't install software on the name server host, but they can install software upstream of it for whatever reason. I think the packet-based solution will always uh, have some users, but we're, we're doing the best we can to move everyone to a, a modern and more functional framework. Um, so again, there's a lot of uh, advantages to this. Uh, and one of them is you can monitor other things besides cache misses. You can tell the server, for example, I would really like to know when you remove something from the cache, uh, because I'd like to know how often that happens. Maybe that will affect how big I should make my cache. And again, that's not something that most name servers have a way of telling you, uh, but DNS tap is a, is a uh, kind of a gateway to that type of monitoring. Um, and uh, it all uses what's called Google protocol buffers. It's a, this is a technology Google developed for their own purposes, which they made open source for which we are grateful. So this allows us to encode and decode the information in the telemetry stream uh, in a way that is uh, very fast. So if, you, if you're trying to collect telemetry using syslog, that's text. Uh, JSON, that's text. Uh, YAML, that's text. And so it's sometimes very useful to have a textual form. But if you're trying to do something that has uh, very strong performance requirements and has to live uh, in a name server where you're sometimes doing tens of thousands of responses or hundreds of thousands of responses per second, you don't want to spend any extra time creating a text form. You just want to sort of throw it together as a binary blob and get rid of it and then let the far end figure it out. And that's what Google Protocol Buffers does well. So we used it. So I mentioned security information exchanges. I've given you some technical background, but now let me just say, um, looking at your own traffic can have the benefits I identified in terms of characterizing your network. It will not have all of the benefits that I identified because sometimes the questions and answers that best inform your defense needs or your investigation needs did not come through your server or through your firewall. They might not have taken place on your network at all. It may be that a transaction between two outside third parties is of interest to you. And you don't need to know who those parties were. You need to know the content of the transaction. I'm gonna give you a demonstration of this in a moment. Um, but what this means is uh, just monitoring traffic for local purposes uh, is not very beneficial. Uh, it's better than nothing, but it's not nearly as good as what you get if you share your observations with trustworthy uh, other parties and benefit from them sharing their uh, telemetry with you. And so we created first, and this was uh, 10 years ago, no, 12 years ago, uh, a global security information exchange. It's headquartered in California. Uh, it is not subject to GDPR, so there are some limitations, although the state of California is trying to catch up, so we're encouraged there. Um, but we've been doing that for a long time. What we found in Europe is that uh, a lot of universities, ISPs, uh, larger companies, and some smaller companies wanted to benefit from this, but they were afraid to send their data outside of the GDPR umbrella. And so in 2018, we launched a nonprofit company. It's headquartered in Karlsruhe, Germany. 
called SIE Europe. Uh, and it has the purpose of gathering information from data participants, which means sensor operators, gathering that data and then making the gathered aggregate data available to its own population. And um, this is not a business. We don't, there's no fee. In fact, there is no way to buy something. The only way you can get access to this data is by becoming a data participant. Um, and this may sound useless to you, but what that means is uh, our data participants are free to monetize what they receive as long as they respect the privacy uh, restrictions. In other words, they can't redistribute what they see, uh, but they can create uh, other artifacts. They could create their own database. They could create their own monitoring service. And so we are encouraging everyone in Europe who has DNS data to share to please join this effort, share your data, and see in exchange for their, their contribution, see the larger contributions of everyone combined. Uh, so that's the, that's the business model, and it is working. Um, it's, uh, we're getting growth every month. We get a few more sensor operators. And so my uh, second motive, uh, I wanted to come to Poland anyway, but my second motive for this talk is to encourage everyone within the sound of my voice to please take a look at this. Consider operating a sensor. Uh, we will be happy to talk to you about the technical, technical requirements, demonstrate to you the benefits you could get as a data participant, and so on. Uh, so my email address is widely known. Uh, please reach out to me or look at the website again. I'll give you that URL at the end. Um, right, so there is a database here, just like we have globally. But in this case, the database does not go back to 2010. Our global database is very old, um, although it's updated constantly. In this case, we only keep the last two months in the database. And that's because we're not looking to compete with other database providers uh, who would you know, maybe have the competitive benefit of having more history. What we wanna do is have something that is vital to the interests of sensor operators, data participants. And so a database that goes back a few months is extremely useful. Uh, it's just not as useful as one that goes back forever. Uh, so again, this is, we have a nonprofit company. We're trying to avoid competing with our own members, with our own uh, sensor operators. Um, so I'll give you a couple of demonstrations here. I have to change what I'm sharing, but I think that'll be okay. Um, let's move to this window. And uh, looks like that is being seen. Um, so let's take a look at uh, the data and let's just pick PLNOG. So we're gonna look, this is a uh, command line tool, DNSDBQ, it's open source, it's on GitHub. And um, it has the ability to make a query against a database like the one at SIE Europe or like the one we have in California um, and then uh, display the results. So let's just take, I have to pick something, I'm picking plnog.pl. Um, okay, that went by a little quick. So let's slow it down. Um, and for that matter, let's sort it to put the newest information first, because otherwise the database just gives you whatever it knows as fast as it, as it can do. Uh, and let's send it through a pager. All right, so you can see that every element in the database has got not just what was seen, in this case, a text record having the sender uh, policy framework rules for this domain, uh, but it also has the number of times that particular pattern has been witnessed and uh, how recently. In other words, this is the first time we saw that pattern. This is the most recent time that we've seen that pattern. So it's not very common. Uh, 79 is a fairly low number, uh, but it has been true in this case for 309 days. Um, and this date of May 6th is relatively speaking modern. Uh, it looks like I'm, I sorted by the time first scenes. So let me change that so I can get the time last scene. Um, yeah, here we go. So this is today's date. Uh, so for 10 years, it has been the case that PLNOG used these two name servers. Um, that's an impressive record. Most things have to change more often than that. So 
this type of stability is something that we really ought to aim for in our operations, but uh, we, we rarely hit it. Uh, but you can see that uh, this is what the PL zone has, the bailiwick. This is where we computed at the time we saw the observation where it was coming from. This was the servers for .pl sending that answer. Uh, we've also seen the servers for plnog.pl send the same answer uh, for about the same period, about 10 years. And um, that's fine. It's supposed to be that you get name servers from the delegator like .pl and you get name servers from your own authority servers. Um, they don't have to be the same, and it's usually a configuration error when they are not the same. In this case, they are the same. So again, I'm just gonna say, this is a very clean result. Now, uh, last thing I wanna demonstrate is, if you're looking at this, you might be thinking, all right, so Vix has given me a demo of something that looks very much like the dig command. And I wrote one version of the dig command, and uh, so you'd be right, I was inspired by normal DNS formats in or when I constructed this particular open source tool. And yes, I wrote this one because I wanted to learn our database. And it was uh, the only way to learn, the best way to uh, learn about something is to fight with it. So I did. Um, but I want to show you that this business of uh, displaying it as uh, dig-like information with DNS comments and resource records and so forth, that's a human convenience. That's something this tool is doing. Uh, that you can tell it to stop. This is the underlying response. This is what you're actually getting for the database. I know that's hard to read, so let me pretty print it. And then you'll see immediately, ah, it's new line delimited JSON. And really any, even a, a fairly new programmer without much experience, but uh, you know, anybody who's at all familiar with Python or Perl or Golang, or C++ or uh, C Sharp uh, JavaScript understands what to do with this. So uh, our intent with the uh, underlying API uh, was that you make a RESTful query, you get back a JSON response, and um, you can then make whatever you wish out of it. Um, and uh, there are plenty of examples on various websites showing, for example, that uh, the source code to this tool, if you wanted to do this in C, that's not a bad example. Although, of course, doing JSON work in C is painful. So if you're, if you're not committed already, then I want to say avoid C just for your own productivity reasons when you're dealing with a database like this one. Um, I do want to note that the in the underlying format, the dates are in Unix time format, the number of seconds since uh, 1969. I don't know exactly why we did that, but uh, you will often have to convert that into something that you can use. Uh, this tool has an option for that, but of course, every language has a way to take a Unix time format and turn it into something else. Um, but uh, really, there's nothing else worth seeing here. Uh, we, we could look at other domain names. Um, what I think I'd like to do, though, uh, is crank up a VPN while I'm talking so that I can show you the real time in addition. Uh, oops, that's not going to work today. All right, looks like I'm not going to show you the real time. Um, but I do want to just describe in general terms that all of the data that comes into our system goes into a shared channel. So this is, it's not zero MQ, it's, it's uh, like nothing else. It's something we invented in 2010 or so, actually earlier than 2010, uh, which um, allows a lot of uh, parallel observers. Uh, you can connect to the channel and uh, push some filters into it. Maybe you, if you are working on Polish internet security, you might say, yeah, I wanna see the real-time data as it comes from the sensors, but I only care if the name ends in .pl. Well, that system can filter that for you and it will send that to you and it'll be a lot like what you just saw, except instead of JSON, it will be Google protocol buffers. We have open source software that will turn it into JSON for you at which point it begins to look just like the Twitter firehose, if you have any familiarity there. 
And so uh, the purpose, again, is so that Europe can observe Europe and uh, Europe can defend itself. Um, so I would encourage anybody who is not operating your own recursive name servers, if you're using Google or Cloudflare or IBM or any of the, 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 the Anycast name servers, please reconsider. Please take a look at not power DNS, unbound, bind, look at those and see about running one. You might have to spend $5 on a Raspberry Pi in, in order to get a server that is capable of running that inside your network. But I encourage you to do that. The privacy benefits are immense. Also, the, the, the utility, the, the resilience you get from operating your own infrastructure is big. Um, but in any case, if you are uh, running your own name server and you have the ability, to, you know, it is your name server, you have permission, you have authority, uh, please consider running a sensor uh, and collecting the data about the cache misses. Again, there would be no personally identifiable information there. Um, and uh, you know, send that data into the cloud, as it were, and either get a database key or get a, a streaming key so that you can watch the combined consolidated data from the rest of Europe and use it in your own purposes. Maybe those are defense related, maybe it's network management. I myself have sometimes used passive DNS in order to reconstruct a server after a loss. Uh, if I need to know, for example, what are all the domain names that my postfix email software is supposed to be able to handle, if I've lost that information in a, a, a file system crash, it's good to be able to ask passive DNS what uh, what owners come up that use my MX server. Let me, uh, I'll give you that example because I've only given you a, a Q name example so far. Uh, I know we need to get to Q and A very soon, so I'm going to stop in just a moment. Um, but let's uh, we've got this MX record uh, for plnog.pl, and it is modern. Oh, okay. Thank you. So what you can see is that the time first seen was only 2019. So this is a relatively modern name server. Um, but let's, uh, well, let's turn some of this stuff off. Let's turn off the JSON, get back to text. And let's just ask the question with a little bit more specificity. Um, Right, so now you're looking at the history of the MX records for plnog.pl. And so you can see that, and this, I've sorted this in, in the client as well as putting it into dig notation. So you can see that for the last year or so, it's had a certain value, which is eml3.networkers.pl. Uh, before that, it was a pro idea. Um, before that, it was also at pro idea, but had a different set of name servers. It used to be, they were called mail and mail2. Then they were mail dash one, mail dash two. Uh, and you can see that back in the earliest record we have, and our database begins in 2010, um, it was uh, self-hosted inside the PLNOG uh, zone itself. So what we might be interested in, of course, PLNOG is not an attacker. They're not, they've never done anything bad to anybody, um, but we might want to know for the provider they're using, um, In other words, if we did a right-hand lookup instead of a left-hand lookup, can we get a list of the other domains that use the same mail server? Well, yes, we can. And so you can see immediately that oh my hack is getting its email through the same mail server that PLNOG gets. And that should not surprise us. Uh, and they've got various uh, other things, hack yeah. Um, and who knows, they might have all kinds of customers. Um, let's could be of interest to us to look for the summary. Just say, well, how many? Well, there were 22 unique owner names that had an MX record matching this particular thing, uh, but those were not static. Those had changed a fair bit. So we actually thought, saw over 1,000 variations on what, the, what those MX records were. In other words, sometimes it was just this one Sometimes it was this one plus another one and so on. Um, so that is the kind of thing that you can do if you have access to a database of this kind. Um, 
So let me again switch back to the URL list. So um, you can look at siereurope.net, uh, but that's uh, that's the business. It's not really a business. It's a nonprofit project, uh, but that will explain uh, how you can join the project and what your obligations will be in terms of running a sensor. It'll give you some technical information about how to do that. Um, and if you want to pursue that, there's a way to send a request to join, at which point we will ask you to look at the data participation agreement, which was crafted in Europe and has been revised a few times in order to make it um, more protective of European data subjects. DNSTAP.info is uh, sort of a technical description of the open source telemetry framework that I told you about. Uh, DNSDB.info is the global database, and uh, that's not really part of the European thing, uh, but uh, we are certainly interested in talking to you about if you, let's say you're an academic and you just need this data to grind out a chapter for your PhD, we want to hear from you because we'll grant that. If you're an internet superhero and you just want to do, uh, you want to protect the internet at night after you're done doing it all day at work, we want to hear from you. And if you have commercial needs, we want to hear from you. Uh, but ultimately what that is, is very similar to the database at SIE Europe. Um, in fact, it is the same software which uh, Farsight operates uh, under the agreement uh, for Europe. Um, and then you can look at our source code repository, the Farsight SEC is our GitHub name. And you can look also at dnsrpz.info. It's not directly related to the rest of this, but it is another set of reasons, motives, why you might want to run your own recursive server because you can, with DNSRPZ, you can program the filtering in that name server. Uh, and it's difficult to predict what you might want to filter uh, but today's domain generation algorithm names should uh, maybe concern you. You might want to make sure that if one of your infected uh, Windows PCs looks up the name that it needs to look up in order to learn from its command and control node what to do, you might wish that that would fail. And you can deliberately cause that failure through DNSRPC. And we've worked extensively with the unbound folks and the power DNS folks and the not folks of course, it was originally prototyped and bind. So that's another fairly universal technology that I wanted to make sure to bring to your attention. And that is, uh, that's my talk. That's my 50 or 45 minutes. And I thank you all for uh, joining, uh, for listening. And I hope to hear questions now or inquiries uh, in email about any of the topics I've discussed. <laughs>